stress is the catalyst, right? So what is stress? Stress is not a thing. It's when the demands being placed in our system exceed what the system handle. Hey, I want to go to Gucci. I want to go get a Gucci bag, but I only have a thousand dollars in the account. Well, I'm going to charge it. When the demands being placed on the system exceed what the system can handle. That is a stress right there. You're spending more money than you have. You're going into debt, right? You shouldn't be buying the Gucci bag. Correlate that with our life. We're all living beyond our means, right? Not saying to sell your kids or quit your job, right? That's not going to regulate your stress. That creates more stress. We, we have to fight stress by fighting back, by building our resiliency to stress, putting more money in the bank account. If you do that, you have a million dollars in the bank account, you go to Gucci, it's not a stress. You can buy a bag. You got a million dollars in your bank account. We have to build our resiliency to stress. But stress is a catalyst. So as I mentioned, the demands being placed in the system exceed what the system can handle. And that in the human comes down to two things, right? It comes down to energy, stored energy. Do we have enough energy in the bank to meet the demands of stress? Why do we make energy? We make energy to meet our demands of stress. It is that simple. Welcome to The Body Never Lies. I'm your host, Leela Lutz. Each week, myself and experts from around the world help you uncover the secret ways your body communicates with you to empower you in your own individual health journey. Josh Rubin's interview on episode one was one of the most popular in the series, so I gather you guys like him and know him well. Honestly, I just really like working with him anyway, so whether you guys like him or not, he was coming back. Josh is a Czech Level 4 certified nutritionist and is about to complete his studies in osteopathic medicine. And if you don't know him yet, I highly recommend you listen to his first episode interview on metabolism in series one and look him up as real food gangsters on instagram josh has been helping people heal using nutritional foundations for metabolic issues such as thyroid disease and various fatigue syndromes for many years and he has been a great mentor of mine now adrenal fatigue is a term coined by the functional medicine practice it has been helpful i have to say in some ways many ways really in recognizing that there is such a thing as physiological burnout we need to make space for that or there will be a whole amount a lot of people who will never heal but josh and i really share the view that the blanket diagnosis and the protocols can just really skim the surface and may limit you in terms of recovery so today we're going to discuss the adrenals and what they do and if they really can get fatigued or not we're also going to talk about what we need to do to get out of this syndrome that allows you to fully return to a nourished and energetic state, enjoying your life. I hope you enjoy the show. Josh Rubin, welcome back to the show. <laughs> Why are you doing that face? Like, oh. so excited. I had to have you back on the show because you're like. Well, because you, 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 fr- you kept freezing. <laughs> Your screen kept freezing and oh. you were like. Oh. <laughs> we're having internet problems everybody <laughs> is this not we're gonna do the best we can we're having internet problems josh is back on the show because he's awesome and you guys loved him so much thanks josh for coming back appreciate on the show. it appreciate it what i've asked josh to come back on the show today to talk about seeing as this series is all about the myths the overwhelm, the confusion, the rubbish that we're all being exposed to on social media by even functional medicine practitioners, health coaches, you name it. So much rubbish out there. I wanted to ask Josh today to talk about adrenal fatigue. The the truth behind adrenal fatigue, what is adrenal fatigue, what it isn't, what it really is, and what you should be doing about it. Take away, Josh. What is adrenal fatigue? Well, let's kind of rewind it for a bit. Um, you, ha- you have to look at it. And I was talking to a client about this this morning. And I- I'm trying to figure out how to say this without being rude. Because my intention is not to be rude. But where does adrenal fatigue come from? The functional medicine industry. Yes, Hans Celia, you know, kind of created the general adaptation syndrome. Right? Talking about you know, alarm and resistance and exhaustion. And I truly believe that was like 
formed into the stages of adrenal fatigue. But when you look at the medical industry, they don't even use it as a diagnosis. So my point in this, I feel like most of the confusion in the industry is coming from the functional medicine part of the industry versus the medical industry. Why? I can't tell you how many people I talk to that say, my doctor did all these different labs and there's nothing wrong with me. Mm. Clients are upset. <clears throat> and I say, that's a good thing. Why? Because doctors are trying to find pathology and they're showing you there's nothing wrong with you. That's a good thing. But you go to a functional medicine practitioner and what do they do? Oh, you got to pay me $2,500. We're going to do all these labs. You're going to take a shitload of supplements and call me back in four months. And if you want to consult again, we got to do it again. And then you leave with adrenal fatigue, food intolerances. I have SIBO, H. pylori. I have gut imbalances, hormone imbalances. I need to take progesterone, pregnenolone, and the list goes on. And this, this snowball perpetuates. And before we know it, we're more confused now than ever because you know, for some people, maybe it works, but for a lot, what happens is like my client this morning at 23 years old, after 23 years of being in the FM tornado, he's come out taking 10 different supplements. He's afraid to eat food. He's mm. eating very little food because of a food intolerance test. Um, and he has all these limiting beliefs around food. So how can you truly heal? It's next to impossible. So I don't know the solution to that. I like talking about it. So people begin to kind of understand what they're doing. If they're in that kind of vortex to really just take a step back and say, what do I really need? Because that's the most important thing every day, whether you're talking about adrenal, thyroid, gut, emotional, it doesn't matter. It's about what you need. Because if let's just say adrenal fatigue is real, right? And the adrenals can get fatigued or you know, there's an increased burden on them. They can take it on the chin, of course, but it's not a diagnosis. Um, so let's say you're diagnosed with adrenal fatigue by a functional medicine practitioner, right? What, do you, what ha happens 99% of the time? They do a saliva test, which is it accurate? Some people say it's not accurate. Why? Because they're testing the unbound cortisol, which is some of the strongest cortisol in the body, but it only makes up three to 5% of the cortisol in the body. So is it really that accurate? I don't know the answer to that. I don't have medical backup to say, is it accurate or not? But is it something I use? No. Um, why? Because it's something we used to use and never really worked except put a red target or, you know, tag under someone's neck. They say have adrenal fatigue. Okay. Now here's what you're going to do. You're going to take licorice root. You're going to take pregnenolone. You're going to take DHEA and you're going to take possibly ph phosphatidylserine and something else, you know? Now, let's think about it. <clears throat> Did all of a sudden one day you have adrenal fatigue? You're like, oh, I have adrenal fatigue. Just got it. No, it's A plus B plus C plus D, whatever, equals the result, the effect, adrenal fatigue. So if how you're living or how you've lived and how you're eating and how you're training and your work and all these things, the soup, create adrenal fatigue, and you just take all these supplements, are you truly healing at, at a deeper level? No, you're not doing it. You, you haven't changed one thing, nothing, not a zero. You haven't changed the thing. So this is why a lot of people get zero results from doing these protocols. They have to do them for a long period of time, or they start to feel better. They go off the protocol and then three or four months, five, six months later, they have adrenal fatigue. Why? Because their life hasn't changed. Right. Whether you had pregnancy, you're depleted of minerals, whether you're overtraining, whether you're chronically stressed, whether you're under eating. If you don't change what caused the adrenal fatigue, nothing's ever going to change. And that's a huge piece of our philosophy. Whether you're talking about adrenal fatigue, a gut problem, viral problem, you have to change. So I like to open it up with that because I think a lot of us are chasing symptoms without really taking a step back and saying, and your, doc, your functional medicine doctors aren't going to do that for you. Why? Because Western medicine, lab sub medication, functional medicine practitioner, lab supplement, the philosophy is no different. They're not going to tell you to stop chasing, right? So you have to, do, you have to take it upon yourself, take a step back and say, whoa, <clears throat> if I don't change, nothing's going to change. Right. That's why we believe none of those supplements are needed. Right. And they don't do the.
the trick because you have to change. If you compensate so bad and have so much debt, you can decompensate out of it, right? You have that power. You control your hormones. Your hormones control your nervous system. In your adrenal, thyroid, nervous system, that plays together. We can talk about that. Mm. That shows you how much power you have. Just like your breath. Your breath, a lot of people think, happens automatically. It's an automatic car. It does. But guess what? You can take control of your breath. It's not all involuntary. Now you can make that car manual and actually take control of your sympathetic, parasympathetic nervous system and your brain, your CO2 levels, your nitric oxide by taking control of your breathing. You can take control of your life, how you're living, when you're working out, if you are listening to your body, what you eat, when you eat, to control your physiology, to heal your adrenals. You don't need supplements. So I just wanted to talk about it because I think it's so important because People believe that's the only thing they can do. Why? And I say this all the time, and I say it with 100% compassion, and I'm not separating myself from this population. It's because as humans, we are so effing lazy. We're lazy. We want results yesterday, mm-hmm. right? We don't want to make change. We don't want to stop working out at 5 a.m. We don't want to eat breakfast. We want to fast till noon, right? It's easier to eat two meals a day or hardly eat than eat food. We don't have the time anymore, Right? You have to take a step back and make those changes because if you don't, you're never going to get past your adrenal issues, right? Mm. So, um, and of course, I could keep going, but I don't want to just, you know, if you have questions. But I think that for a lot of people is an eye opener. And I hear that a lot because they're like, oh, my God, you're right. I'm doing functional medicine. And I keep after paying $2,000, you know, and it's just this rabbit hole keeps growing. And now I'm taking 15 supplements and we're not talking talking about my food we're not talking about my life and now that you're saying about oh my god like i have four kids and i'm super stressed and i have no me time and i'm exhausted and i don't get sleep the supplements are going to do jack squat jack squat i think um it's there's a few different symptoms of it right like i've had a few different clients with it and they have different stories right like there's there's a lot of people that are they're overworking and so their story is that, you know, I work too hard and I got adrenal fatigue. So yes. now I can't work that hard. So I've had to give up my life or change my job or whatever to be able to do it. Some truth, not all true, right? Um, so, you know, I mean people who are f- very fragile. Yes. Because they say that they've healed from adrenal fatigue, but they're actually, when I look at them, super fragile and can't cope with anything well yeah here's the thing when you when you let's say you're born with a million i always use this example i say it all the time because for a lot of people it just makes sense you're born with a million dollars in your bank account what you eat how you live a b c d that starts to withdraw money the question is that you're putting money back in Mm -hmm. and a lot of us are not keeping up so over time you know if you get hundred thousand dollars still feels good but over time we end up in debt If you go into debt, you can pay your debt off. Same thing energetically, right? And the problem is, as a culture, we're living beyond our means. We're not eating enough food, right? We're fasting now. We're not eating enough food. We're overworking. We're chronically stressed. Now that we have COVID going on, people are chronically emotionally stressed from that. So we have all these stressors and people say, well, like, how do you stop stress? Because when you talk about these adrenal glands, if you're not talking about stress, then you don't really know what you're talking about because when you talk about disease, that is the catalyst, right? Study Hans Celia's work, Constance Martin, you study anyone, right? Stress. That is the deciding factor. You know, even people now today, like Morley Robbins, um, Ray P like all these different people, there's, there's so many more, but I'm just saying people that a lot of people know about. Um, stress is the catalyst, right? Mm-hmm. So what is stress? Stress is, not a thing. It's when the demands being placed on our system exceed what the system handle. Hey, I want to go to Gucci. I want to go get a Gucci bag, but I only have a thousand dollars in the account. Well, I'm going to charge it. When the demands being placed on the system exceed what the system can handle. That is a stress right there. You're spending more money than you have. You're going into debt, right? You shouldn't be buying the Gucci bag. Correlate that with our life. We're all living beyond our means, right? Not saying to sell your kids or quit your job. Right. That's not going to regulate your stress. That creates more stress. We, we have to fight stress by fighting back. 
by building our resiliency to stress, putting more money in the bank account. If you do that, you have a million dollars in the bank account, you go to Gucci, it's not a stress. You can buy a bag. You got a million dollars in your bank account. I have no idea how much Gucci bags cost, but it sounded really good. So <laughs> we have to build a resiliency to stress, but stress is the catalyst. So as I mentioned, the demands being placed in the system see what the system can handle. And that in the human comes down to two things, right? It comes down to energy, stored energy. Do we have enough energy in the bank to meet the demands of stress? Why do we make energy? We make energy to meet our demands of stress. It is that simple. That is life. Just like you start your car, you drive, you need gas to move. Same thing. We need energy to fight stress. Now, we don't have enough energy in the system. That's when things in our life become a stress, right? So I could say to someone with one child, how is it? It's amazing. It's the best thing in the world. Life is great. I'm healthy. I'm sleeping. I talk to someone else with one kid, like, oh my, they can't even handle it. Mm. Is a child a stress? No, it's not. It's our resiliency to be able to handle the stress, right? Stress doesn't kill us. It's our reaction to it that does. Just like if I said to you, let's go to a haunted house, Layla. You might be like, hell no, that would scare the crap out of me. My heart rate would go up. I'd be traumatized. And I'm like, let's do it. That's so much fun. Stress is not a thing. Now, of course, trauma is, it's a little different, right? You get a car accident or you see someone get murdered. Like, of course, you're not immune to that. That's a trauma, but it's, it's the same thing. It's the physiological reaction that happens in our system, which dictates it being a trauma or a stress right? Hypothalamus, pituitary, adrenal, thyroid, etc. Physiology through the vagus nerve, diaphragm, organs, face, all that interrelation. So if we have energy in the system in the form of, let's say, food, and we're eating the right foods, and we're eating in the right frequency, and we're living in a way that allows us to meet our demands, you put energy in the tank. So when stress hits, the adrenal glands kick in, but you have reserves you regulate the stress, whether it's going on a roller coaster, getting in a, 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 an emotional fight, doing something at work, but you can come back down to homeostasis, right? You don't just stay there and keep withdrawing money, right? You come back down. That's what we want to be able to do. But because of how people are eating, how they're living, keto, low carb, carnivore, fasting, right? We're living beyond our means. We go into that state and we keep withdrawing money. We never come back down. So now the littlest things become a stress physiologically. So now the adrenal glands are taking it on the chin 24 seven and they're not meant to be right now along with that. And of course, if you have questions, just interrupt me, you know, um, I was going to say, can you explain for people the mechanism of adrenaline fatigue? I'm saying it with air quotes. Yeah. Can yeah. you explain it to people so they can visualize it in their body, understand it, you know, what's exactly going on? Because I think Yeah, that's so when, when that energy well. is deficient, your your adrenal glands kick in, right? Your nervous system kicks in as well. So you release adrenaline, noradrenaline, nervous system, and cortisol. This this is your body's way to adapt. Your body is a machine. And, and we'll talk about minerals in a second because they go with it. It's not just about them. And that's another thing. If someone's like, take pregnenolone, they're focusing on a small piece of what the endocrine system really does. And they're missing the biggest piece, which is the minerals, right? So those, those kick in. And initially, you're going to feel good. Adrenaline, adrenaline junkie, you feel good on that. That's why stage one adrenal fatigue, according to the people, you know, you have high, high uh, cortisol, high DHEA. That's what you see in a lab. And that could be for two months. It could be a few years. It just depends on the person's resiliency. And usually in a stage one adrenal fatigue for a lot of people, they feel good. Why? Adrenaline, nervous system. It's heightened, right? You feel good. But your body can only be in that state for so long. There's only so long you can run from a lion. There's only so long you can stay on a roller coaster. After a while, it starts to get a little bit tiring. So then you hit that peak but that's stage two, according to saliva labs. And that's where you start to see, I think it's cortisol is up, but DHA starts to drop, right? That's your stage two adrenal fatigue. You're still in a stress state, but now 
you know, you had a million dollars, but you kept withdrawing. You had, you know, you know, 800,000, you're in stage one, but over time, you know, you're maybe at 200,000 now, you're, or 100,000, you're at stage two. DHEA is dropping, you're getting close to zero, but cortisol is still high. And stage three is when DHEA and cortisol are low, right? You don't have the, the ability to fight stress anymore because you, you've been on the roller coaster for so long, and now all your reserves are, are lost, your energy is lost, your, your, your minerals are lost. So now within the system, you start to see things slow down. So starting out, you see the body becomes hypervigilant, right? Stage one and two, you start to see, you know, body temperature go up. Then over time, pulse goes up. And then over time, when things start to dysregulate, you can't regulate anymore because you've lost a lot of your minerals. You lost a lot of your energy. You start to see body temperature and pulse actually go very low. And that's your kind of stage three adrenal fatigue. That is your deep kind of parasympathetic dorsal vagal stage of the nervous system. You've been chronic for so long. Now you're in a million dollars in debt, right? You don't have the reserves to meet the demands of daily life anymore to regulate blood sugar, to regulate blood pressure, right? To regulate inflammation. So these people have you know, reg- regular blood pressure, high blood pressure, low blood pressure. They're chronically inflamed. They start getting all these immune system issues, food intolerances, the list goes on, right? Because chronic stress suppresses the immune system. So those are kind of your basic just stages of adrenal fatigue. And of course, as people, I think it was Charles Pollican, he's dead now, but you know, he he said there was like five stages or seven stages of adrenal fatigue and who knows anymore, but those are the three basic stages. Mm. And I think one of the common things that happens, right, is that you you start to crave sugar. This is what I see often. You crave sugar, but then everybody tells you that's part of the problem, stop eating sugar. Right. <laughs> well, two things. Would you typically, and I hate going by symptoms, but typically when people have adrenal fatigue or like their adrenals are taking on the chin, they crave salt and sugar, Mm. right? Why? Because stress is the perceived need for sugar because sugar is energy in the system. I don't mean white sugar, I just mean carbs, you know, like fruits and roots and that type of sugar. Um, And that's the energy that's stored in the liver. That's what your, your liver uses to convert T4 to T3 active thyroid hormone to your Cells can use it to, to turn on the mitochondria, right? So you can produce energy. And that energy auto-regulates nervous system and quiets the system down and regulates vagal tone, right? So people crave the sugar because they need it. That's the bottom line because that's the energy they need to quiet the system down. I'm not saying you don't need proteins and fats, but that sugar plays a huge role in, in allowing, and this is part of our process, allowing the adrenal glands to quiet down. Why? It's really simple. You know, in, in one sense, what do the adrenal glands release? Glucocorticoids. Why is it called glucocorticoids? Because it regulates blood sugar, glucose, right? So if we have energy coming in and it's stored, the adrenal glands are less apt to be over, overburdened because now there's energy in the system. They only come online when there's not enough, or if we have a a severe stress, like we go on a super long hike or we're on stage and we get, you know, jitters, or we do go on a roller coaster, like stress isn't bad. And and we need that extra energy, but we come off, we regulate. It's there when we need it, right? Because those hormones help us break down proteins and fats for usable energy, but it's not long-term sustainable energy. It's usable in a time of stress, right? So they crave, sugar for that reason. They crave salt because initially when you are stressed or you could say going through adrenal fatigue or whatever you want to call it, stress causes a loss of magnesium. Mm-hmm. And the body is all about balance. It's all about ratios. Nothing in the body is bad. So if someone says estrogen's bad, run, right? Just run. Nothing in the body is bad. If I didn't have estrogen, I wouldn't be male. If you didn't have estrogen, you wouldn't be female the amount that you have. Same thing with testosterone for me, same thing with testosterone for you. Magnesium, sodium, that ratio needs to be balanced, okay? So if that ratio is not balanced and we're stressed and we start to lose that from the body, the body will compensate. 
right? So when those minerals get thrown off, aldosterone is released. Aldosterone regulates minerals. What is aldosterone released by? Urinal glands, right? So they take it on the chin again. So they regulate potassium, sodium, magnesium. And these minerals are important. Why? Because the relationship and ratio between sodium magne- or magnesium and sodium, I think it's five to one. Don't mark me on that, but I think it's five to one. And the ratio of calcium, potassium. So sodium and, and um, magnesium and sodium regulate how the adrenals actually work. So anytime those ratios fluctuate, it's going to tank how the adrenals work and their ability to do their job. So anytime we're stressed, we begin losing magnesium. Aldosterone kicks in, tries to regulate, but it's all about balances. Same thing. Once you start to lose magnesium, you're going to lose sodium because the body wants to regulate its balances, not enough magnesium in the system. You start to lose sodium, but the ratio between sodium and potassium, I think, I think it's 15 to one. I could be wrong, but it has a ratio. But if you're losing sodium, the body says, I need to let go of some potassium to try to keep this ratio balanced. So the bottom line is you start losing all these minerals. These minerals are the only way you can regulate the adrenal glands. Calcium, potassium is the only way you can regulate the thyroid and their relationship, right? And and they, they can do their job. At the same time, if you start to lose magnesium under chronic stress, you can produce energy through the mitochondria, but the only way ATP can be visible to your body, let's say, is if magnesium is plugged into it. So if you don't have magnesium, that ATP is invisible, it's useless. So another key point with adrenal fatigue is people lose so many minerals, and if they're not replacing them, right, and this is a huge part of our process, you're going to have so much adrenal stress. This is why these hormones that people are taking don't work. You need food to get the adrenals quiet down so they don't take it on the chin. You have to eat in a way and live in a way to quiet them down. Then, of course, you're using food, but food and some minor supplement support to bring back the minerals in to replenish them so you can hydrate your cells, so you can regulate the adrenal, the thyroid, that relationship and how the system works. Because if you don't have that balance, you can't produce energy. You can't produce energy, guess what? You're going to be in an inflammatory state, and that's a physiological fact, right? So that's where inflammation starts. So if you can use food and minerals or energy and minerals to regulate that, you can really go back to what I said in the beginning, pay your debt off over time, right? If you can get into debt, you can pay it off. And that's what our RTM method and our approach is all about, helping people pay back their debt with food. Scientifically below the surface, we have a philosophy, but on the surface, we just teach people how to eat food strategically to meet their metabolic needs. Because mm. most people come out of that going, oh, well, I have a magnesium supplement, right? Thanks, Josh. I'm not on magnesium. I'll just go have a magnesium supplement. Well, this is, this is a huge problem right now, right? And this is why our process is very strategic. It's like first grade to go to second, to go to third, et cetera. So the first piece is when we talk about, let's talk about adrenal thyroid relationship first, and then we can go. Yeah. into what you just said with magnesium. It, you can't talk about the adrenals without talking about the thyroid. It's impossible, right? 100%. Why? Because the adrenal glands regulate the availability of fuel, glucocorticoid, right? They kick in when it's not available. It's that simple. It does it because it allows and gives the thyroid fuel to burn. So it can produce and convert thyroid hormone. So your cells can use that to produce energy. So if you don't have fuel to burn, what happens? The adrenal, the thyroid is going to essentially, we'll use the term, slow down, right? And this is why we believe from doing this work 20 years, a lot of people we come in contact with truly don't have a thyroid issue, right? They have more of a, a stress, we could say adrenal issue, whatever you want to call it. Why? Because when you're looking at the adrenal glands and that going back to what he said, that overproduction of cortisol, a loss of magnesium, right? It's been shown that the excess cortisol does two things. It affects T4 to T3 conversion, right? So meaning your thyroid produces T4, but you need glucose, right? And in certain things to convert it to active thyroid hormone T3 so your cells can use it. But cortisol get into there and affects your five prime deodinase enzyme, which is selenium and 
magnesium dependent. So two things are happening. Stress depletes magnesium, that enzyme becomes less active, and then cortisol gets in there and blocks that conversion, right? So is it a thyroid issue or is it a stress issue given the illusion of a thyroid issue? And that's what we feel kind of is happening a lot of the time with people when it comes to adrenal thyroid relationship. Now, of course, there's other scenarios, but I'd say that's the most common, mm. right? So what we're trying to do is um, we're trying to teach people to be aware of how they're living, right? So they can create change, not sell their kids, not stop working out, but how do you be more strategic and tune into when, how you need to live to meet your metabolic needs. Cause if you have adrenal fatigue, essentially how you're living and how you're eating is not working for you. Mm-hmm. So you have to change. And then we work with the food. Why? Because if we teach people to eat metabolic foods in balance in a strategic way throughout the day to meet their metabolic needs, what happens? We meet the energy. need. So now you quiet down the adrenals, whether they have normal body temperatures and pulses or they have super high pulses. We see their pulses come down over time. That would be like your stage two adrenal fatigue, right? Why? Because now you're meeting the body's needs. So you quiet the stress response first with the food, which we call our food foundation, which is creating balance with those foods, creating awareness of what works for you, frequency that works for you, et cetera, and how you need to live to support yourself. Then with, along with the foods that you're eating, the different proteins and the different fruits and roots, and then using, you know, we, we add in the adrenal cocktail, which is orange juice, uh, white sea salt, and coconut water, right? Why? Because now that the foundation is there and you're not being, you're not eliminating magnesium and sodium and potassium, right? Now, you, the, the, let's just say like the, the plug is, is, is plugged. Now we can start replenishing them. Now we can bring in the, the, the sodium from the salt and the potassium from the, the coconut water. Right? We tell people usually do that twice a day, depending on the person, to replenish those ratios in the cell, that sodium-potassium pump. So we can start building up your sodium before we add magnesium later on, fifth mm-hmm. grade. We're in first grade. Why? Because if you start adding too much magnesium supplement and your sodium's low, you inverse the relationship, that ratio, and that creates more confusion in cell death. Right? Uh, sodium, 15, magnesium, no. Yeah, sodium 15, magnesium, I think it's five to one. Forget the exact ratio. Let's just go with five to one. I could be way off, but I know it's like this, sodium, magnesium. So we have to build up sodium first because we've lost so much from the stress response, right? And then later on, we can add in magnesium now that there's sodium in the system and the ratio is going to be more balanced, right? Um, so you get the sodium potassium from the, um, adrenal cocktail. The reason the orange juice is in there, everyone thinks it's for the sugar from our standpoint, the more we learn, the reason it's in there is because it contains an enzyme called tyrosinase. Mm. And for us, when we talk about the thyroid, the fastest way to regulate bioavailable copper in the body is with two things, vitamin A and vitamin C. Why? You need vitamin A to convert copper into bioavailable copper, which is a protein called ceruloplasmin, right? Vitamin C contains an enzyme called tyrosinase, which stimulates your liver, which is one of your liver's functions, to produce seroplasmin, which is a protein, right? So it's very supportive. Why is copper so important? Of course, vitamin A is so important for thyroid hormone production and conversion. But copper is even more important bioavailable copper why because it stimulates trh which stimulates tsh etc it starts the whole domino effect and it's used in your cell right through cytochrome p oxidase and p oxidase or something like cytochrome oxidase enzyme that was discovered by um to get his name right now but anyway it's an enzyme in your cell that's copper dependent that allows you to produce energy so you can produce thyroid hormone, but if you don't have that copper in the cell or at the beginning and in the cell, nothing's going to happen. So the simple drink can add so much benefit for people with adrenal issues, sodium, potassium, and thyroid issues, the tyrosinase, the bioavailable copper, right? So that, I'm really simplifying the steps here. Food, adding an adrenal cocktail, and then as we move through the process, you know, we're replenishing minerals. 
We're putting energy back in the bank account. We're saying adrenal glands, you can, you can quiet down now. You can come online when you need to, but you don't need to be on all the time. And now what are we doing? We're strengthening the relationship between the adrenals and the thyroid, right? This fuel, the adrenal, the, the, this fuel, so now this fuel to burn. The thyroid can convert a thyroid hormone. Your cells can use it. And this is the most important thing. Because if your cells are producing energy, this increases the feedback loop, right? And in a sense, think of it like this. We know feel good is like 50 engines out of hundreds of thousands that should be working. But as you're eating and making these changes, more engines turn on, more fuel is needed, more minerals are needed. And, you know, the average cell has one to 200 mitochondria, which is that, that powerhouse. But your liver, I think, has like 2,000. Your cells and your liver have 2,000 mitochondria. The cells in your heart have like 5,000 mitochondria in them. Why? It's your heart. Think about it. The, the average egg cell has like, I think it's like 200,000 or something like that mitochondria. You can see the importance of where the mitochondria go, right? But we need to be able to use T3. We need to be able to use glucose. We need to be able to use copper and oxygen from how we breathe to produce energy, which is ATP. Right? But now the ATP can be seen because we're eating foods with magnesium. We replenish the magnesium with a supplement later on. And now ATP can be seen. So that feedback loop keeps going. But at the same time, it helps us auto-regulate our nervous system, sympathetic, parasympathetic. Right? And this is the most important thing because everyone thinks it's all about how do I strengthen my parasympathetic system? And these are the people that go to yoga. They do breath work. And I'm like, I thought I was doing it right. I was eating clean. It's going to yoga. I don't know how I have a nodule on my thyroid or how I'm not feeling better, right? You have to quiet down the, par- the sympathetic first. And that's what we're doing in our approach. When you do that, along with producing energy, you strengthen the parasympathetic nervous in the same time. And that's the break for the sympathetic. So now it comes, the break comes off. We go sympathetic when we need to. But then we have so much vagal tone, it comes back on on when it needs to control it right and that's what the process is all about so when you talk about adrenal fatigue if you're not talking about the thyroid the nervous system the energy and the cells and the minerals you're not talking adrenal fatigue so i hope all that kind of made sense of course it makes sense to me but i hope for people listening they can kind of connect the dots and and hopefully it makes sense because um the science is complex but really like i said when people come to us let's eat food let's regulate the system Let's do that first, create a foundation, quiet the system down. Then we go to the adrenal fatigue, the, the adrenal cocktail, you know, and then we might add another one or two supplements along the way to support that, the minerals in a sense, mm. um, whether it's desiccated liver, which contains vitamin A, we can convert it. Now that the liver is working from the food in the adrenal cocktail, that that vitamin A and copper in the system can be converted. So it's all a strategic system to get the adrenal thyroid nervous system relationship working better. So the system can quiet down, right? So we can heal, build up the immune system and regulate inflammation. Mm. And this is the big piece. I think people are not looking at like they come to me and I'm probably seeing the same with adrenal fatigue. I had this woman come to the adrenal fatigue. She came in with a Parker on like a big puffer goose down jacket and it was like 20 degrees celsius outside i'm like okay little it's good it's a bit extreme for a goose down jacket i'm assuming warm yeah well it's you know mild our our temperature in winter you know would be like what's 20 degrees celsius so like it's so hard to work out the fahrenheit right it's like you're basically saying she shouldn't have a jacket on she shouldn't have a jacket on i was looking at her like i'm i'm hot looking at her you know it was sunny. It was, you know, it wasn't winter. Let's just put it that way. Um, she, and she came in and she said, oh, you know, I've got adrenal fatigue. I've been working with my doctor, but I'm, you know, I'm better now. I don't have adrenal fatigue anymore. I'm like, okay, cool. So what do you do all day? She's like, I've basically given up my job and I sleep a lot and, you know, okay, what do you eat? She's like, oh, well, I have a smoothie for breakfast. You know, it's got green things in it and, and I have a salad for lunch and then I have some fish and vegetables for dinner right but I don't have adrenal fatigue anymore I'm just you know I'm just really tired I'm just resting I don't want to get (laughs) this is classic (laughs) that I see right so 
her doctor had never really asked her about what she ate. She just like heard that and went, oh, that's healthy. Okay, cool. That's healthy. She eats clean. She eats vegetables. You know, she's having a smoothie. There's no junk in there, right? And then I look at her and go, oh, well, she's slim. So, you know, slim, slim is healthy, right? So I don't really need to focus about her food. And then it just, cool, we'll take all these supplements, you know, let's test you for 50 million other things. Um, it must be something else. Whereas I'm looking at her and going, well, she's cold, <laughs> one thing, okay. And when I talk to her, I'm like, you're just not eating enough food as well. And then there's such this misconception that eating salad is good for you. Um, having a smoothie for breakfast is enough food. And no one's looking at that. And then when I go into her history, it's this um, overworking but always not for weight loss. And this is, I think this is really important because some people, she's not doing it for weight loss. She's just doing all these different clean diets to try and get energy and feel better and, you know, so I look at this one, she's never going to heal because we don't, we're not looking at the food piece. Yeah. And the truth is she's just not eating enough food and doctors are saying, well, here's the thing. People are eating to survive, right? People are eating to survive and not thrive. Yeah. So think of it like this. If I was to light a fire and it's super cold outside, I don't know Celsius and compare Fahrenheit, but let's say it's super cold. To the point where you wake up and you can see your breath that yeah. cold, right? If you were like, I need to light a fire, and there's many things that can light a fire, whether it's paper, sticks, some sawdust, some leaves, you know, or some big logs. So people are eating to survive versus thrive. So for me, I'd wake up and put some damn logs on the fire. Why? Because I know it's going to create a nice fire and it's going to be efficient. Another two, three, four hours, depending on where it's at, I can throw in another one or two logs to keep it going. And that fire, that heat is going to be like this, right? Energy is heat, right? So we're going to create efficient heat throughout the day. But what people are doing is they're throwing lick, sticks and leaves on their fire, mm -hmm. right? So it's not producing enough energy, and that's why people aren't warm. They're cold because they're not producing ATP, they're not producing CO2, that's energy. They're not putting logs in their fire. They're having green drinks, salads, right? None of those things, that's throwing leaves on a fire. They're going to burn, but in five seconds, they're gone, right? And that's why people don't have consistent energy during the day. That's why people don't have a consistent body temperature, right? I mean, it's winter here in Idaho. I wear shorts all winter. I hate putting on pants, number one. But number two, I wear shorts all winter, um, it's because you're like a ball well. of muscle. Well, I've always been. My mom <laughs> you guys are saying Josh is enormous. It's like a ball of muscle. <laughs> my mother used to call me a bowl, a Your bowl car's as big as like two of my thighs. <laughs> it's know. awesome. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm exaggerating. Um, <laughs> but I truly believe that I was, I, I mean, I've always been like that. My mother used to call me a polar bear. But I, and I, I was sick at one point, you know, six years ago, I was really sick and I was freezing. I remember sitting, I was supposed to do a CrossFit competition. And I shouldn't have gone. And I went and everyone was running around having a good time. I had a blanket on. I was shivering. I could barely talk. I was super sick. Right. Um, so when we produce energy, we have heat and people are eating to survive. So people, I, I can tell you this, that in 20 years, I haven't started working with one client that eats enough to meet their minimal needs. Everyone. Under eat. I agree Everyone. 100%. Everyone is massively yeah. under eating. And that's Everyone why I wanted to bring it up. Yeah. And a lot of people say, I eat all the time. It doesn't matter. You under eat. Trust yeah. me. And I'm not saying you need 4,000 calories. I'm not even looking at calories. I'm just saying people don't eat enough because they're eating green drinks and smoothies and a cup of broth and a piece of fruit. They're, they're, they're eating and then they eat six hours later. People aren't eating enough because I guarantee you if people logged it, they would see they're getting 900, maybe 1,000 calories. It's common. I see it all the time. Not even focusing on calories, but people just don't eat enough and they don't eat frequently enough to meet their metabolic demands every day. We have busy lives. We have lots of kids. We have a lot going on. You need to fuel that. And think of yourself like a child. If you have children and your ch child was going to school for the day and they had a busy day, they were going on a field trip, then they were going to the park. Then they were doing something in school, different activities. You want to go, here's Susie. Here's your milk. Go ahead. 
you know, you're doing a 16 hour fast, right? How would that work for, for four year old Susie? Shit show, right? You're no different. What do you do for your kids? You go here, this is what we do for Harrison. Okay. Here's his snack that he's in around 10. You know, here's his lunch. Here's the snack for the afternoon. He goes to school with the lunch box of, a, of two snacks for the day, his lunch and two drinks. One of them is an adrenal cocktail, not because we push it on him, but he saw us drinking all the time and he would always ask what it is. He loves them. Oh, we can't even keep enough orange juice. <laughs> Chuck, he loves one. them too. <laughs> he says, oh, I need an adrenal cocktail. He probably drinks two or three a day and he drinks a ton of milk. But he always drank a ton of milk, um, which is obviously amazing because of the vitamin A and copper and all these things. But we, we send him with enough energy to get him through the day. Because what happens when kids don't eat? You know when, you, you know when, when, when your daughter's hungry. Why? Because it turns into her brat. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The littlest things piss them off. They go with tantrums. No, you're no different. The problem is we're going to work all day. We're not getting enough sleep, right? We're doing all these things that are withdrawing money. We're just not depositing it because we want to lose weight or we want to eat clean. Or we want to do keto or we want to do these things. The problem is none of those things, none of those diets will meet your metabolic needs ever. Or or we're just lazy. I've heard people who just don't want to do food prep, don't want to take the time. So they push themselves through that, you know, at work. I don't have time to eat lunch. I don't need lunch. Well, I think it comes down to weight loss. That is the number one goal. You can add little things after it's number one reason why people do keto, carnivore, paleo, you name it, is weight loss. And unfortunately, that should not be the driving factor when you're talking about getting healthy because it's impossible. Because weight loss is not from overeating. What are you talking about? How many clients I work with that hardly eat and they're overweight? Oh, same. Because it's the system that's going into that's the problem, right? We could be hyperinsulinic, right? Um, like PCOS, everything in between. We're chronically stressed. Of course, we're going to downregulate insulin. All these different things can happen over time, but it's the system that's going in it into that could be the problem, right? It's not, I mean, of course, if someone's severely overeating, they're gaining weight. Yes. But you have to regulate your physiology first to get healthy before you can even think about losing weight. It's about environment, right? So for us, that's what we focus on, to strengthen the relationship, to get people healthy, to get money in the bank so we increase our resiliency to stress, right? So we, we, we can uh, uh, adapt our ability to respond, versus react to stress. So things become less of a physiological stress. But if they are, we have the necessary means to meet it, right? So what happens? We feel more resilient, right? We have more metabolic reserve. And that's to us, that's what healing is. Mm. And it's really getting away from that, all those diets, because people are, so many people are doing keto for their adrenal fatigue. Did you see there's a new hashtag on Instagram? I saw this girl who's got Hashimoto's and her, her, her hashtag, she has Hashimoto's, wait for it. And her hashtag is keto vor. Nice. And, you know, and this is, the thing where you go online and it's like, oh, I can, I can do this. This chick, this chick's got Hashimoto's. I'm going to do what she's doing because that's how I'm going to heal. And then it starts this whole snowball effect, right? Well, the, the hard piece is, is people are not taking the time to understand what they're doing to their body and putting in their body, right? And there's another big one that, that kind of rolls my, my feathers, like estrogen dominance. Like it's so, I can't stand when people say that. I hate mm. it. Um, because they treat estrogen dominance without really understanding the mechanism, Mm. right? And when you look at estrogen, it's important in the body. And your body detoxifies it through the liver. It gets rid of what's actually harsh and keeps what it needs. Because you need to regulate that ratio of estrogen and and testosterone, estrogen and progesterone in your body, right? The problem is when you're chronically stressed, this was shown by the work of Broda Barnes, was shown by the work of Morley Robbins, other people, um, when you're chronically stressed, the liver becomes very overburdened and becomes somewhat sluggish, right? And what happens is estrogen gets recycled. So it means it, a lot of it gets 
recycled into the system and your tissues become super saturated. And this is why a lot of women will gain weight. And what happens is now that estrogen increases, this is how this in thyroid hormone are created, or well, you could say adrenal stress will cause that sluggish liver, right? The hypoglycemia, which leads to the recirculation of estrogen, right? Doesn't mean you have high estrogen. Doesn't mean you have low progesterone, right? Um, it's, it's a stress response. And that increased estrogen will do two things. It'll stimulate histamine, right? And it will increase thyroid binding globulin, which is a protein that binds to thyroid hormone in the blood. More thyroid binding globulin, which means what? Less bioavailable thyroid hormone, which means you have a thyroid problem, but you really don't. It's the illusion. Mm. It's, it's old. The other thing is it'll stimulate histamine. The problem is what, what's one of the biggest things we see in this industry right now? Histamine issues. Don't eat the food. I mean, histamine. Yeah, histamine that's, yeah. that's, that's looking at that problem like this. It's the food that's the problem. We love to blame food. It's not the food, right? So when you overproduce histamine, which is part of what your mast cells produce, part of your immune system, you have an enzyme called DAO that cleans it up. It's like if I had dump trucks dumping dirt here one after another and I needed people to clean it up, that's the DAO to put it onto the lot next to me that's getting construction. Simple analogy. But what if those workers weren't here? All that dirt's going to build up. That's your histamine. Guess what DAO is dependent on? It's enzyme. That enzyme is dependent on copper and vitamin C, mm-hmm. right? So it's about being backwards. It's not just going, how do I treat the estrogen dominance? How do I support the liver? You've got to go back to the stress response. You've got to go back to it. That's where everything starts. I'm telling you, hands down, that's where everything starts with some people. Right. Whether it was a traumatic event in your childhood, you know, whether it was emotional abuse, sexual abuse, whether it was a severe trauma, a chronic stressor, a diet, a surgery, you know, a divorce, doesn't matter. That's where a lot of that stuff starts for people. Mm-hmm. People will say to me, I don't know, I, like I just talked to a lady from Canada. I don't know. It's just so weird. Like I eat clean. I work out. I thought I was living healthy. And then I have Hashimoto's. I'm like, oh, everyone thinks that in the past one, two, three, four years of your life, that, that this is where it's coming from. At 36, it's a story. Everything from conception till now added up is creating who you are. Mm. To try to figure out where it came from, good luck. That's a, that's a rabbit hole in itself. And of course, you have different pieces, whether it's emotional counseling or things that you need. But you got to got to rewire the system. You have to strengthen the adrenal thyroid nervous system relation. If you don't, the environment is not going to change and you're not going to change, right? And that's how powerful we believe in our work and what it does. It's simple, but it's very powerful at a deep level. So simple, but so powerful because you're giving people back the control. Exactly. You don't have to go to the doctor all the time, get some more labs done, get some more supplements. You know, sometimes I see clients who've got a cut like thousands of dollars in their cupboard full of supplements. They can't even afford that kind of protocol in the first place. And there's so many supplements right. they can't, they, they don't, they're not even taking them. They don't even remember to take them. It's, um, there's no power in it for them. And then, like you said, they were so afraid to eat because, oh, well, I heard all histamines are bad for me. So I know I'm not eating all histamine foods. I heard sugar's bad for me. So now I'm not eating sugar. And then it's just a cascade of one. It's crazy to me because everyone them. loves to blame food. Everyone loves to blame food. It's insane. But they'll take 15 synthetic supplements and yeah. vitamins. All vitamins you're taking are synthetic. So the worst thing you could probably do is take a supplement with a vitamin. They're all synthetic. Whether it's vitamin A, vitamin C, ascorbic acid is not vitamin C. All vitamin C and 99% of supplements are synthetic. Calcium, zinc, they're all synthetic, right? D, the, all those things are horrendous to take. Why? Most of them chelate copper and they deplete vitamin A in the liver. What happens? You can't convert copper now, right? Two things happen. When you can't convert copper, iron will go up in your tissues, which is oxidative stress, right? That's going to cause inflammation. And then, of course, you can't produce thyroid hormone. You can't regulate your cells, can't regulate adrenals. So people are taking all these supplements, what they're taking, and they're all synthetic, 
Um, and then you can't, you're blaming food. You can't break down food, but you're taking 15 supplements. It just makes no sense to me. So we're just trying to keep, get people back to the simplicity of I'm human. I need food to survive. I need to be aware of how I'm living, just like you do with your kids. And if you do that, we take the burden off the adrenals. We don't need those supplements. We help so many people with adrenal fatigue without any of those hormones or supplements. Mm. 100%. And I think it's what uh, the sad thing I think is people are in that phase of being an adrenaline junkie. Like, I feel like so many clients were like, but I feel amazing. And they're right. actually like living on adrenaline because it feels awesome. So they love doing cleanses because every time you get a cleanse, <laughs> you tip into the, res- the stress response, release a whole lot of adrenaline, right? And then you just eat normal food again. And you feel shit when you eat normal food. Well, the problem is this, two things. Uh, detoxes are actually useless. <laughs> you know, it, basically you're saying you're looking at the liver as a filter and the liver is not a filter, number one. Yeah, that's um, what I wanted to ask you about, actually, because I think, yeah, too, when people not, hear the liver's overburdened, they think, oh, my God, I've got to clean my liver and do a cleanse. Yeah. The liver actually has two phases of detoxification and it essentially takes things in phase one and makes them less toxic. Let's just simplify it to phase two so we can poop them and pee them up. That's what happens. Um, You have to learn to trust your body. We've lost the ability to trust our body. Mm. And it's almost like if your car had a problem was your tires and you're like, I'm just going to do an oil change. That's all a detox is. It's 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 it does it does nothing. It does nothing, right? They're in my opinion a waste of time and money um, because it's it's like instead of taking something to reduce inflammation and taking something to reduce toxins, why don't you live in a way that reduces inflammation? Why don't you live and eat in a way that allows your body to do what it's designed to do? Let's say and create health or detoxify, right? Um, secondly. Hans Hille talked about this a lot. He talked about how a lot of people were actually addicted to their stress hormones, mm. right? And these are the people that have trouble with being alone, trouble not doing something, trouble sitting still, trouble being bored, right? That's like 99% of our society. Yeah. Because what do we do? We never are alone. We're like this all the time. Scrolling. Or we're in front of the TV <laughs> or the computer. We're never alone. You know, so most people are addicted to their stress hormones, whether they believe it or not. Right. Um, And this is why you see a lot of people, you know, certain signs of like when they go on vacation, they actually get sick or feel worse when they start to quiet down because those stress hormones aren't there anymore, you know, to keep them kind of hypervigilant. But it's a problem. People are very addicted to their stress hormones. And it's, it's hard because a lot of people are doing what they need to to survive. Mm -hmm. And it's all they know. So when you start teaching them a different way and start to help them tune in, it's very foreign. It's very scary because then they have to start feeling again. Right. They have to start feeling what's going on in their body. They have to start tuning into really what's not working for them. And for a lot of people, that's super, super scary. Most people are numb. We ask people on their food log how they feel. Talk to a 23 year old this morning. I don't really know. Mm -hmm. How can you not know, right? Because we're numb. That's the la- that's the fifth level of pain is numbness, right? We're taught to do that. And a lot of us have been addicted for so long to our stress hormones when they're gone, we don't really know how we feel. So we're just helping people. This is based off the work of Gabor Mate. It's like he talked about how trauma, which is not the thing that happened. It's the reaction physiologically that hardwires our system. That's the trauma. It's our reaction to it right? Same thing with the stress. What it does is it disconnects us from self. Mm. So what we're trying to do is get people back to self from feeling again, creating awareness and, and that's it. And it doesn't have to be like, um, you know, this kind of therapy where you need to go to, you know, like your mental case kind of thing can be as simple as like, you know, I grew up in a really stressful environment that was, you know, uh, or parents always fighting and separating and there quite often wasn't enough food because my mum couldn't afford. I didn't realise that till I was older because I realised I was always saying I was hungry and she's like, well, there's, 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 it's all gone, you know. Um, but I used that stress, 
that to fuel myself to get through university, to get, you know, academically um, somewhere so that I could be different from my family. And what I did through my 20s was use that, those stress hormones to get away, like this away from mentality, right? And so now that I'm looking back at it, you know, through having worked with you, having worked with Tomo, it's like, do I, do I go find the root cause of the stress? No, I don't think it's that. I think it's just accepting <laughs> that for most of my life I've been living on stress hormone and that got me to a place. And then when I, when I, I remember in my late 20s I started to actually go, oh, I think I'm actually meant to be alone sometimes, you know, not be in a relationship to validate my self-worth. I'm meant to be alone. I'm meant to take time off. And, you know, so it's not about, I think a lot of people look for the root cause and it's not realizing that it's just an accumulation. Yeah. You're never going to find it. Yeah. Don't stop looking. Is what I'm saying. I mean, you, know? you can do emotional work and talk about different things, but it's, it's everything is, is psychosocial and, 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 you know, psychosocial theory. It's like, you can't separate the social and psychological aspects of someone's life from their biology. So everyone's like, Oh, is the diet is this is, it could have been when you were when you were born, your parents didn't want to have a baby. That psychological yeah. aspect, you know, and there's so many things that lead up to who we are today. That's why I tell people just stop searching right now and just realize you're soup from zero to six. Like it's just like it is what it is. Let's just figure out how to work on this piece of the puzzle to build your resiliency. And then if you feel like you need emotional counseling to, to process other things, of course. But you need that resiliency and i feel this is why a lot of emotional counseling doesn't work for people because mm. they don't have the resiliency to handle the things that come up so build your resiliency first with lifestyle modification nutrition modification now you have more resiliency so when you go to emotional counseling it's not a stress it's actually a benefit because you have you can handle it you can work through it you can process it yeah and I think it's also doing the work that is, you know, like you guys can go back and listen to my first episode. I had my emotional coach come on and talk about coaching is the process of self-parenting, so learning yeah. to hold your inner child and take care of them, which involves getting up in the morning, making your child breakfast as soon as you wake up. Nobody would let their child go till lunchtime without food, like you say. And I remember that was a really pivotal piece for one of my clients when I said that to her. She really wanted to get pregnant, but she didn't eat till 12. And I was like, what would right. you if you had a baby? She's like, I would feed them as soon as I wake up. And I'm like, okay, well, you need to hold that space for yourself as an adult and say I'm going to feed my inner child when I wake up. You know, I don't think it needs to be this full-on you know, I need to go and get therapy for. Right. But it's being able to sit in that space, right? Like one of my clients a few weeks ago, she said, I never realised until I started logging and writing down my food and all this stuff that I am addicted to the feeling of being empty. Like mm. it's a badge of honour to be empty of food. And, you know, for her it was just realising the badge of honour is being empty after an awesome poo. That is <laughs> the empty feeling that you want to have. You know, it's just tapping into those feelings and not yeah. running away from them. <laughs> but I guess that's, that can be hard for a lot of people because I think that's where they realise that, well, I've actually been committing self-harm or self-abuse or just ignoring myself and not giving myself space and time. And I would never do that to another person. Right. I would never ignore my best friend who was crying about something. I would never ignore my child. I'd pick up my child and I'd hold them. I wouldn't go, you stupid asshole, don't eat food. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I agree 100%. Oh, so, yeah, it's, it's um, I think what you and Jeannie are doing and what you taught me with the way you do it as well is that all of this is just about holding space for yourself and yeah you have to create a space to heal yeah that's another huge thing like people are living these crazy lives and they're like i want to heal i want to do this program you gotta you gotta make space for it because if you don't it's never gonna work you're never gonna be compliant we have to create space to heal it's it's a lifestyle totally it's like, and it's also our society, right? We're always taught, a lot of us, I was brought up to believe that you put everyone else before yourself. Right. 
you take care of everybody else and then if there's time left, which there never is, then you can take care of yourself. And, you know, that's how a lot of people operate. That's the good Christian thing to do, the good, you know, um, mothering thing to do. Right. Just tapping into all that. Yeah, I love I love what you guys are doing, um, obviously, because Josh has coached me personally, which has been amazing. Um, so I really would, if you haven't checked them out yet check out their group coaching uh you got a group coaching package you do one-on-one coaching we do group coaching the next one launches in february but the the enrollment starts in december we ha- we do one-on-one coaching all the time um and our website's eastwesthealing.com we are very active on social media especially instagram our instagram is real food gangsters um you you can get the link to that um, from our website. Yeah. I'll pop them in the show notes too. All yeah. those links. You know, we have an opt in yada, yada, yada. So definitely check us out. We have a lot of free information. We offer a free consult for everyone, free 15 minute consult, no obligation. So you can access that on Instagram or our website. So there's a lot there, you know, whether you want to work with us or not to really support yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And you, you know, you have to find you guys when you're looking for a practitioner, you know, you have to, and it's one of the reasons why I want to do this podcast is that you have to find the person that you resonate with, mm-hmm. that you can have a connection with, because you're going to have to dump your shit. <laughs> yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. So, you know, yeah, and that's, I mean, that's another key point because it's not just me, me and my wife own the business. She does consulting too. She does group. She does all that stuff. She was actually supposed to be on the podcast today, but our, our son and had to get picked early from, from preschool. So, but you know, there's both of us. So it's great. I mean, our population is predominantly women. I think it's like 75, 25 women to men. We do work with men, but we both work with, I predominantly work with women. We both do, but you know, some people say I'd rather work with a a female. Of course she's there. So it works out well for people. Um, you know, because we do the same thing. We have different personalities, of course. And, um, that's a great option for people. That's interesting that you have such a high level of female clients. So do I. Do you think it's just because female are more in tune or more susceptible to stress? Or they? I don't think they're more, more in tune. I just think they're they're um, more apt to let go, know it all, and I can handle it. And it's not a big deal. Men will usually let it hit rock bottom before they ask for help. Yeah, I actually see a lot of men, male friends, and. My husband will say to me, don't you want to say something to them? Because, like, he's, like, on the way down. And I'm like, no, 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 you have to let. (laughs) No, I wouldn't never give anyone advice unless they ask me for it. So, But I do notice that with men. it's there. There's a lot of stuff going on and they don't pay attention to it. Right. Whereas women are a bit more. I think it's well, right, because we want to have babies and we want to do this. So there's, you know, one of the first things to go is your fertility. So you have to do something about it more before a a man has to do it. They're sort of like hit rock bottom. So really interesting. But I really, I missed your um, live. I really wanted to watch your IGTV with um, Sam dancing. Yeah, we had a problem getting that back online. Something happened, but we're going to be on his radio, his, his, so. Yeah, so look, after, look out for that, guys. If yeah. you are, um, you know, you're thinking about, Josh for your husband because it's really interesting because Sam Dasting is a professional athlete, right? And he worked with Josh. We think that health problems belong to the, you know, we think they belong to the people who eat out of, you know, vending machines <laughs> and McDonald's, but they don't. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, um, so, everyone. Yeah. And um a lot, especially a lot, I think, with professional athletes actually. Yeah. And people who participate in high-level sport or train more than twice a week. And, you know, I think I'm really looking forward to seeing you and Sam have a chat so I can share that with more male clients. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, yeah, he's a cool guy. Well, thanks for coming on the show, Josh. I'm going to put everybody's, all your stuff in the show notes. Guys, please check Josh out. Follow him on Instagram. That's that's where he likes to live is Instagram. Thank you. Real Food Gangsters. Yeah. Um, and we'll, I'm sure we'll have you back because I'm going to get messages from people going, can we have Josh back? I appreciate back? it. Anytime. <laughs> thanks, dude. I'm Lady Lutz and you've been listening to The Body Never Lies. 
If you haven't yet, please go to your favorite podcast app and subscribe, rate and review this podcast. All the resources and references from this episode are waiting for you on my website, leelalutz.com. Just click on podcast and look for this episode. Now join me next week for another episode of The Body Never Lies. Thank you so much for listening.